because I knew my children were going to find out and they were going to just say, yep, I knew it. I was right. He's a loser. He's a homeless punk out in the woods. He don't want to be a dad. How long did it take till you knew this was your person? A while. A while, yeah. I mean, we liked each other and everything, but... Mm. Take a girl and a guy, and they fall madly in love and form a family. Sprinkle in some counseling degrees and a doctorate. A dream of transforming relationships as we know it. And 20 years later, we give you power couple Dr. Ray and Jean Ketkodian. And this is Couples Synergy. And welcome back to another episode of Couple Synergy with Dr. Ray and Jean. Hi, I'm Dr. Ray. And I'm Jean. And this is our podcast about love, marriage, and relationships. Check us out online at couplesynergy.com or on Facebook and Instagram at Couple Synergy. And please subscribe to our podcast and leave us a review or send any suggestions on topics you'd like to hear more about. And now on to Couple Synergy, an in-depth look at love, marriage, and relationships, where we bring you our experience helping thousands of couples transform their relationships for over 20 years. Every day we get to hear intimate details about a couple's celebrations, disappointments, and everyday challenges. We've often wished these stories were shared because we know we are more similar than different. So we've created not only an avenue we can hear about people's intimate lives, but an atmosphere where people come over to our home pub, pour a drink, and share their stories. People like today's guests, Wayne and Bernadine. Wayne and Bernadine, thank you so much for being on our podcast today. Thank you. Thank you. We're really glad to be here with you guys today. So before we get into your story, why don't you guys tell us a little bit about yourselves? How old are you and what do you do for a living and how long Mm. have you been together? I'm 54. I'm a semi driver. Well, I'm 54 as of February. We're both 54. And I keep saying that she's my senior because she's six years, six months older than me. So that's kind of a gig in our relationship. She's always my elder with respect. But uh, right now we're both semi-truck drivers, different companies. We're not owners, we're company drivers, and we go all over. We're just happily ever after as a married married couple now. And how and long we, have you guys been so, together? We've been together 10 years, I think. We're both nodding our heads. We've been together 10 years as of 2011. We've been married eight, eight years and can it's you tell us the story of how you guys met? Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> Are you interested on the uh, internet? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. We we were just clicking around, and there was this app called Are You Interested? You know, and both of us were kind of like determined never to do internet dating or anything, but we just ended up clicking on, seeing each other on there. It's kind of a interesting dynamic because neither one of us are interested very much in the internet platforms and all that stuff. But I ended up seeing her and I saw her little, you know, her picture, her thumbnail, and she just hooked me and I got in touch with her. And I lived like an hour away. So I had to drive an hour to meet her. And she was, uh, I thought she was working at a restaurant, but it turns out she was actually the owner and she was running this place. And so she was always on her feet, moving and running and working fast. And every time I'd call and try to talk to her, she was running the kitchen or serving food and kind of out of my element because I was a maintenance technician for apartments. That's what I enjoy doing. So that's, uh, it was a hard job and it took a lot of hours, but we fit each other in. Where'd you guys go on your first date? The restaurant. (laughs) (laughs) After she closed, it was our regular thing. I'd show up on the weekend and I'd just kind of hang around and watch them do their closing. And then after they would close, we would sit and eat and and hang out. But I think that's an interesting part of your guys' story, because it sounds like your whole marriage is like that, like fitting each other in. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Accommodating and adjusting schedules. And how long did it take till you know, till you knew this was your person? A while. A while, yeah. I mean, we liked each other and everything, but mm. what, like he was telling you, he has the bipolar issues and the anger issues. And then I had a young son about, what, 12? 12, 13. And he had the same issues. And yeah, those two together were rough. Well, it was like I was able to, you know, 
guys, we can be swingers, man. I can put on my, I can put on my face and, and performance for the weekend. But after two or three, four weekends, she started really noticing who I really was behind just showing up and being the, the cool guy trying to get the date. But her son was doing the same thing. He was being a good sport about it. He was just trying to put on his best performance too. Cause mom was trying to see this guy and he was trying to kind of just let us have our space. But after a while, me and him got to know each other more and we started clashing more. And so this is more of a story of a mother being torn in between love and motherhood. And we've built it since then. So how long did you guys date then? A year. Probably. Probably a year before we got, before I was forced into a one knee commitment to it. <laughs> <laughs> you were forced by me. <laughs> well, my mother pulled a stunt on us where scared me to death. We were we were kind of alternating between visiting my mom on the weekends and visiting some of her family on the weekends. And my mom connected with Bernie immediately, you know, as women. And I was still kind of on the outside trying to kind of figure out if I really wanted to commit to this. And I was sending her, I was bombarding her with like 10 paragraph letters kind of thing on Facebook messenger saying, I am not going to be in a long distance relationship. Just so you understand, we can see each other and hang out, but don't you be telling me we're going to be in a long distance relationship. And the joke is now we're both semi truck drivers and we're on opposite ends of the country (laughs) at any time. We have a long distance relationship. Yes, but it's quite different. (laughs) But uh, yeah, so after we showed up one weekend at my mom's and by surprise, my mom had this thing set up in the living room. It was a rocking chair on this white fluffy looking rug and flowers. It It looked like this thing in there. And she wanted me to get on one knee and commit myself to Bernie as exclusive dating, you know, exclusive. Cause my mom kept hearing me say, well, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to stick around. That girl's got troubles of her own and her teenage son is out of control. And, but my mom knew something really special about Bernie that I didn't see yet because they connected as women, which is a different thing for me. Bernie, can you talk about what was happening for you and how old was your son and how did you guys resolve that? Uh, My son was about 12 and um, uh, I don't know. We just worked together to get it resolved. Um, Wayne, you know, came around more and we tried to do things, more things with Zach. And um, so he got to know him a little better and seen that he was trying to help because he would come and fix things and um, help with whatever I needed help with. He was always willing to be there and help. And Zach could see that, you know, he was actually helping me and, and uh, he wanted to be there for us. So that that's, was... that's kind of a backstory of the last couple boyfriends that were there that they, they wanted the woman, but didn't want the baggage kind of thing. And so when I showed up, I kind of noticed that right away. And so I just kind of bought into it and I just let her know like, Hey, if we're going to be dating, I'm here for, you know, the whole thing, I'm here for the whole thing, but neither one of us had skills to deal with the dynamic of what was going on. I mean, I was working on skills to manage myself because I really started learning what bipolar was and what borderline disorder was and kind of the intensity that I was dealing with it. Cause I didn't, I didn't think that I had such a problem, but everybody else did. Everybody, everybody else was always reminding me of how intense my anger was and how intense my general mood shifts and everything were. And I started noticing immediately kind of Zach was demonstrating or displaying the exact same thing that people were telling me about me. Yeah, that's how we found out Zach had the issue. Yeah, and but man, the only to answer your question, we just faced it. Whatever it was that happened, we just had to just look at each other and hold each other's hand and just kind of walk along and talk about things. But I don't think we really 
threatened each other with like, well, if this don't calm down, I'm out. You know, after, after a few weeks of dating, we just knew that we were in it and the boat had a little hole in it and we were trickling water, but we were going to, we were going to tread water anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Wayne, you know, you talked a little bit about bipolar illness. I know that you have, you know, kind of a history, uh, a pretty tough history with bipolar. Can you talk a little bit about that, about that background? Yeah. Um, the hardest thing about mental health in general, mental health, when mental health becomes mental illness, there's a transition there. Um, I was not at all familiar with, you know, the difference between mental health and mental illness. So back in about 2008, um, I think I was 38 years old ish and I was really trying to find out what my problem was because I was bouncing from job to job and I couldn't hold a job, man. I would get a, I was professional at getting a job, but within two weeks I'd either quit or get fired. And it was all about my temper and my shifting moods and just attacking people with like sarcasm, just awful. And, and you so you weren't aware of it. No, I, I just thought I was wounded. I was hurt because I was separated from my children at the time and just went through a divorce. And, but this, this, I don't want to take up the whole podcast talking about the history of how my thing developed, but it was a very gradual consistent pattern of similar behaviors and they weren't triggered by like authentic you know most people weren't trying to offend me i just took offense to everything most people weren't being sarcastic i interpreted it as as sarcastic most people weren't trying to uh you know make me feel like i'm not equal or i'm not a man or i'm not you know you know, whatever that we, we have this persona the, of what a, what a father supposed to be. So I was a deadbeat dad. I was called a deadbeat dad for many years. And a lot of it was because I would get on the phone with my children. My daughters were young teenagers that, at that time, they didn't mean to like trigger my feelings, but as soon as I felt like they were badgering me in some way or accusing me of not being a good dad, instead of handling it kind of with a mature response, I would just literally like fly off the handle and just say really mean things. The, the typical, the, the typical Novert cart, the covert narcissist, the covert mm -hmm. narcissistic emotional abuse. I was doing that to them to inflict pain on them on purpose. Do you know why? I that's a part of the, that's a part of the problem with bipolar and borderline kind of combined. Um, it's to be honest with you, it's the way the brain works. It's not, it's not something I did because I knew why it's. Did, did it make you feel something like, were you trying to cope with something? Is that a part of it? I think it was the more that I've learned about it, I, guys, I've done a lot of search, you know, I've done a lot of research since then. Um, I've done several podcast recordings specifically about that, which we can mention later on. Like I've got a YouTube channel with those things there and stuff, but the more that I'm learning about it, I had an extreme case of codependency, mm -hmm. real codependency, not, not the kind of, you know, I wasn't just a little bit intimidated that my daughters wouldn't call me or, you know, block me on their phones. I was actually like starving if I couldn't get them to call. And it ruined my moods so much that I was so obsessive with wanting their approval and wanting their connection. I, I wanted them to understand why I felt angry. So I was always telling them my story of how their mother did me wrong and how this happened and how that happened. But I never, at that time, I never actually told them how I caused those people to leave me, you know. I didn't take responsibility for the divorce. I just said that the mother always was never happy with me and just and that and the other thing. And it was always her fault. And through the years, I see like a crystal glass, just about everything that happened back then was a pattern of my own doing. And How did so, that happen? How did you get that wake up and start doing the work? This was a very gradual process of 
me being cornered uh, emotionally and mentally, I always felt kind of claustrophobic. I always, I literally, when I was in Portland, Oregon from 2005 to 2007, for a three-year period, I was experiencing a lot of homelessness. And at first, I just kind of took to the streets because there was a lot of homeless people out there already. And I would, I was just hanging around with them because I had such a hard time getting along on jobs. And I had a really hard time making friends because everybody that I encountered talked about what I needed to change about myself. And I got so tired of hearing it and so fed up as if like, why in the world is everybody pointing at me? You know, like, why don't, why don't I have the right to, to be angry, you know, about things that have happened to me? I didn't understand social skills. But at one time I was camping in the woods, literally in a tent, and I was very seriously contemplating suicide, not in the usual way. I was obsessing with it as if this would be a, a, a relief. I mean, I wasn't one to commit suicide because my life was so terrible about the past. I was actually, I had a rope up in a tree and for like five days, it stayed up in the tree. And every day I came to my campsite, I just looked at the rope as if this is my golden ticket out of pain, you know? And so what it was, was I didn't want to face the future. I was so tore up emotionally and tore up and, and, and mentally. And I was in so much pain of anger. Like I was so angry about everything, everyone and everything in my life, my children and everything, especially because being codependent, which I didn't know back then, I actually needed my children's approval. I needed them to call me. I needed them to connect with me. It's sort of like I'm counting on them to call me, but they won't call. So it was their fault that I was in pain. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And then that's probably why you would sort of want them to be in pain. Yeah. I wanted them to be in pain for, because, I, because as in my mind, they were the reason I was in so much pain because they weren't just calling me being the daughters and letting me be the dad. But without going into a whole lot of backstory, I wasn't the dad. I couldn't be the dad. I didn't have the capability to be the dad that they needed. They had they, each of my children. I had three children by two different mothers, but each of them had their own bruises. Each of my children, all three of them were seriously victimized by me every one of them had a list you know dating back through the years where i was taking out my anger and my pain somehow making them feel guilty because i was in pain that's how i just treated everyone pretty much but by the time i got to that point in the woods to answer your question what turned me around mm -hmm. one morning i cut the rope down because i was i was looking at it and i was drinking my coffee and i had to i had to make the decision i was either going to do this and let whatever happened happen because I knew my children were going to find out and they were going to just say, yep, I knew it. I was right. We told you he's a loser. He's a homeless punk out in the woods. He don't want to be a dad and he's a loser and he hung himself. Or I was going to have to just change my mind and man up and actually get my life together, having nothing to do with them. I had to do it for me. It and in order to do that, it's sort of like you're asking a heroin addict to lay down the needle. Mm-hmm and just never go back or the alcoholic never go back and to ask a codependent person that's obsessive about needing acceptance and cooperation from everybody to walking away from that. It wasn't just walking away from homelessness. It was walking away from needing people in my life, my friends, my coworkers and everybody else to just agree with me all the time. I had to find a way to just be a person without needing their approval. At what and that point played into the marriage Bernie, here because Bernie, I kind of came point, into the marriage. Bernie, at what point did you learn about Wayne's history? Uh, while we were dating and such, we, you know, of course got to know each other and we talked about the issues that he were ha was having. And he, you know, we talked about his children and, you know, I try to give him some insight on my point of views of, you know, how maybe to talk to him and, you know, don't like start an argument or whatever with him, but, you know, just talk to him and then, 
give them some time and it's up to them whether they call you back or not. And, um, she also demonstrated a lot of that just with her interactions with her friends and family. She, she wasn't hung up on whether people liked her or not or agreed with her or not. And to me, that was just, I didn't understand that. I think your son was instrumental in me sharing myself completely with you because everything that he was going through back then, I just kept telling you, he's a younger me. He's, he's doing exactly what I did. Didn't I? Yes. All the time. And then it made you say, well, what the heck does that mean? Like what's next, you know? Yeah. And how do we help him? How do we help him? And I'm like, well, geez, I don't know. I've never had to help somebody. I've just been stranded trying to help myself. And then I know a lot of uh, his family, they take medicine for depression and everything. And he's seen how it made them all like zombies. Family, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Wayne's family. They made him like zombies. And he's like, I don't want to be like that. And so that's why he did all the uh, research that he had done to uh, learn more about it. So he could try to work on it. And I thought that was very admirable. I think that's the word for uh, trying to, you know, work through his his problems and not just get on some kind of drug and let that take care of it. So it seemed like it was kind of meant to be right for Wayne, for you guys to meet. Yeah. And then also to be able to help her son and help yourself in the process. And that's that last comment she made is, is also a, a, a fork in the road. Cause I was a veteran pot smoker, man. I, from thir- 14 years old, 15 years old, as soon as I first discovered it, 1982, 1983, up until when we met, I smoked pot and that was my thing. That was my go-to thing, but I haven't, it hasn't touched my lips since 2000, what, 11, possibly now sometime in 2011, not a drink of booze, I quit cigarettes after 30 years and I don't take any meds. I don't take any pills, prescription pills, none of that. I've, you know, I can't say that I shouldn't, (laughs) but what I get to is, and this isn't, I'm hoping this is more about me and my wife, but in my experience, what I've come to realize, and I think you guys have probably met a lot of people too, that will say the same thing. Once we realize there's something more to our patterns of, you know, depression, anxiety, worry. I know people that are obsessive worriers, like my mother. Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. You, anytime you see her, she's got this worried frown on her face, and she's just looking for something to go wrong. You know, she's obsessive about it. But once we realize mental health has become mental illness, there's a fork in the road. And we're either going to just let the doctors give us medications to just manage those so-called manage our, our symptoms, or we're going to use that kind of as an intervention and learn skills. And I went all in on learning skills for different reasons, but I experimented with everything you can think of. And I'm talking meth not heroin. I never really did heroin and some of the hard stuff, but Coke, meth, pills, booze, pot. I was mixing pills with my pot. I was sprinkling meth on my pot. I was drinking and smoking pot, having a cigarette while I was doing that. I mean, that's just all of this stuff so that I didn't have to feel anything. And eventually this all before you met Bernie or actually yeah, while you guys were together. Definitely. Okay. Before, <laughs> before, what was my, con- I want her to tell you, what was my problem with trying to get high when you knew me? You'd already smoked so much. You couldn't get high anymore. Yeah. You got how much, how much, how much money was I spending on a hundred dollars a week, a hundred dollars a week on weed. And it was the kind of pot when you pull it out of the pocket, it's in the baggie. When you pull it out of your pocket, you could smell it in the room. Mm-hmm. Sure been good. It would have been great, you know, if I could enjoy it, but I, my tolerance to it had just been so, I just got to where I could smoke several times a day, just like cigarettes. When you see somebody every hour on the hour, they're out smoking cigarette. I was 
I had a loaded pot pipe in my pocket and that was my baby. It really sounds like if narcissism is being completely focused on yourself and what you can get, the way out was to focus on other people and what you could give. Does that sound like that was part of your journey, especially with her son? Probably. Uh, I don't want to turn over the religious card here, but I actually found the peace and quiet that I needed to experience by going to a church. Mm. Um, I try, I was in many counseling sessions. I was in many therapy sessions. I've been analyzed and, and everything by doctors and psychiatrists. I had been given um, psychological evaluations through the years. And so what I found in church was a peace and a calm, a quiet. I'm talking about an inner peace inside my mind, an inner peace that I couldn't find anywhere. And so by doing that, I also had a certain measure of guilt associated with, well, I would go into church and hang out and clap and listen to their songs and stuff and bow my head and go through the things and listen to the pastor. And then immediately I would be out in the car, lighting up my little one hitter, getting a, getting a buzz on the way home. <laughs> so I sort of felt hypocritical and I was like, well, it's not a sin issue. This is about, I'm either going to take this seriously or I'm just kind of half in. And so when I decided to go all in, I was, I was more doing it because of my wife, Bernie. She wasn't my wife at the time, but guys, I could see through her. She's so transparent. My, this lady right here, she's tough as nails, man. She's, <laughs> she's a Brutus. I'm trying to art, you know, we, we tickle fight a lot. We wrestle around, like she'll throw me on the bed and then just like try to pin me down. I can't get out from under her, man. And it ain't because she's big. It's because she's strong. <laughs> she's determined, but she's got this tenderness that she just carries with her. And that touched me more, to be honest with you. I was hurting her, just her watching me and see me have my meltdowns and her witnessing me do the things I was doing, um, uh, tore me up more than the guilt complex of like leaving church and smoking pot. It wasn't guilt because of sin or anything. It was guilt because I wasn't authentic. Bernie, what and, it, was it about him that you fell in love with? Uh, because he was willing to um, be there for me. He, uh, I think he's the first man that ever stood up to anybody for me. Uh, he was willing to help do anything that I needed to do and, I think one of the things that really hooked her, which I didn't do intentionally, I just did it because I was on a quest to be authentic. And I saw this tenderness in her that touched me. And I found out that she had had a miscarriage years ago. She's got three sons all together, Tim, Zach, and Cody. Tim is now 30, 36. Zach is 22. And Cody was the middle child, right? Yes. So she carried this baby to term, but it was born stillborn, right? I ain't blood to death. Yeah, it, it, so it didn't survive the birth. And through the years, she, I found out later by picking and piecing together the little hints that she would give me about her private life. No boyfriend that she had before me acknowledged her pain about that. And even people in the family don't really talk about it because she just kind of goes into crying and stuff. But I was the first, you know, when I found out about it, I found out that this, this happened in the month of October. And so it was coincidentally October something. And I just came to her one day and I said, you know, I found out about, you know, your miscarriage and I know he's buried over here. Would you like to take a couple hours today and just go over there and give respects? And she looked at me. I thought I offended her. She said, why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, because I just, I just feel like he deserves respects. And I feel like you deserve to grieve, you know? And she just kind of started crying. And she said, nobody's ever done that for her. What was that like for you, Bernie? Yeah. When somebody actually cares, then that means a whole lot. Yeah. We were not meant to go through this life alone. And uh, there's not very many people that would actually 
you know, give their time and energy and effort to stand beside you. It really is amazing how healing that is. And, you know, we think we need fancy words and all sorts of big moments. And really it is someone who stands beside you. Yeah. You know, having your person is a life witness and to share your life with someone, you know, in the closest possible way, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, I think is, and we've said in many podcasts before is the, the most challenging and most rewarding relationship we would ever have in our lives. I think what I learned, um, part of what she's experiencing now is it's, it's still so tender to the touch Mm -hmm. mainly because what I learned with my bipolar experiences and some of the other stuff I was going through. I mean, we've heard 10, you know, you know what I mean? There's 10,000 videos out there about what narcissism is, but I'm basically a recovering narcissist and it's still to this day, I know it's so much a part of my character and personality because when I want to resort to it, I can, I can just turn my emotions off and not give two pennies what anybody thinks in a moment. But my wife, I don't have that power with her. (laughs) (laughs) She starts saying something that's making me mad or whatever. And I get mad and I show my feathers and I walk out the door and I'm standing out the door going, dude, that's my wife. You know, like, She deserves better than this. And I always, 100% of the time, come back in quietly and pretty humbly. And and I start apologizing and telling her how important she is to me. What I'm getting to is when we don't know how to deal with our emotions and we don't actually have a language to describe how we feel, people around us don't know how to help. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yep, that is. You know? And after a long, after such a long period of time goes by, we know that these feelings are mounting up and developing more strength within us to subdue us because we don't know how to cope or what to do with those feelings. And what I kind of learned through my church experience, um, I don't, I'm not leaning toward the heaven and hell message or is just Jesus real But spirituality, when we start experiencing spirituality in in a genuine way, kind of for the first time, there's a lot within our emotional spirit side of our bodies that hasn't been expressed before. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It's been locked up, right? It's been kept in there and we've subdued it, especially when you come from a family like most of her relatives are pretty tough people i mean they were like suck it up like what are you what are you crying about what do you you know what's your problem you got to go to work today they're not the soft cushiony emotional types we don't sit around on thanksgiving and talk about our emotions you know we talk about motorcycles and and guns but what bernie experiences when when dealing with this particular issue her spirit is expressing her spirit inside is expressing gratitude and relief i guess over the years because ever since it happened what year was that you remember what year many years ago 15 maybe 27 27 years ago for 20 so for 22 years at least you never really had a way to cope with it or deal with it or express it you never talked about it much and so then I come along and I touch that button and I open Pandora's box for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and still to this day, it's not, it, I don't think it's a hurt though. It's not, you're not crying because you're hurting, right? No, it's just the point that it's tender. Yeah. It's just a tender touch and sensitive to the touch. But well, it definitely would be grief. Yeah. It's grief, you know, but when your spirit is able to express, we don't have words for that. And it's like when you hear a song, you know, and you get a tear, or you just start crying. You don't even know why, you know, like somebody's sitting there right beside you like, dude, it's Rocky. They're playing Rocky. Why are you crying? You know, and it's because something in your spirit has to express. And the way we do it is just through that emotional release. Mm-hmm. I used to do that with anger. I used to do that with bitterness and sarcasm. I used to attack people because that was my release, my, my energy of release. And now I, I don't go out of the way to 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't go out of my way to like be nice to people or whatever. <laughs> but I'd I, rather not. I'd rather not. I'd I'm rather, the nice one. <laughs> I know. I'd rather not engage with people, but when I do see the opportunity to encourage someone, I take it, don't I? Yes, you do. If I, if it's authentic, I don't, I don't, I don't just come up and try to, you know, it's like when I read the book, how to win friends and influence people, you know, I was, <laughs> I was like 30 years old and I was like, Oh, goody. Now I know how to really flatter people, but it was with that narcissistic edge. And it. it was like, I can use this as a tool, you know, to get close to people, to get what I need. You know, Wayne, you said something really interesting that <laughs> I think is is a really powerful message is that you were way more in control of your emotions or, or how you were manipulating people with narcissism than it looks like on the outside to people. It looks like out of control. Well, it was it was I was in control of my emotions as far as I, I actually got pretty much joy in inflicting pain on people. That was my pleasure. For some reason, it's a. Tw I know it sounds twisted, but in the research I've done, I have no choice but to admit what I've learned. Mm -hmm. The reason I was composed, I would sit in the lunchroom and listen to all the coworkers around me, and I would listen to things they were saying so that when they come up and started something with me, quote unquote, I knew what to say. You know, I knew how to attack them. I was always calculating a way to injure somebody. And now I'm literally on the opposite end of yep. that. Yes. Yeah. Where <laughs> I, I say you've done a three, six turn around. <laughs> I have that kind of awareness and I use that skill that I used to hurt people. I use that skill now to help them. to actually try and help somebody in and some would way. Would you say your relationship with Bernie was instrumental in turning you around? It was the only <laughs> thing that turned me. It was, yes, it was. I mean, I've been telling it for a long time. And even in my other podcasts, before I even heard about Couple Synergy podcast, I was doing podcast recordings. And I'm I am always self-obligated to admit somewhere in my story that Bernie loving me just with her authentic self, she didn't have any motive. She didn't have anything to gain from me. I'm going to tell them something that you don't know. Ready? Okay. You ready? Yeah. I found one of her little notebooks one day when she was working at the restaurant. Oh, you bet it. <laughs> her sister-in-law, her sister-in-law was her confidant. You know, her sister-in-law grew up with her from high school. They were best buddies. I found this little sterno notebook laying open in the bedroom, and it was a list of things. And I started looking at it because when I first looked at it, it looked like a grocery list. But actually, you know what it was? It said at the top, I want a man that, and then it was a list of things that she wanted to find in a man, in a relationship. And everything on that, most of the things on that list, I wasn't there yet. I actually wasn't working very much because it was like this really out of the way rural town, this little town with like 50 people that live there. Yeah. And I was using that as an excuse. I was just kind of hanging out at her house and I was like, well, I'm not costing you money. You weren't, you know, I'm not costing you any money. So it doesn't matter if I work. That was on the list. She wanted a man that could help her with the bills. She wanted a man that was not uh, angry all the time. She wanted a man that didn't slam the doors wasn't a drunk she wanted a man that wasn't a drunk i wasn't necessarily a drunk but the, there was a couple boyfriends that were there was a couple drunks in the family that are kind of the typical the typical lazy do nothing but get drunk every day but there was this list and i saw this list and i'm like i can get like three out of ten i checked <laughs> I was like three out of 10 on this list, man. And I wasn't there. And that motivated me so much. I was like, she doesn't just want a guy that's killing time here because I don't have anything better to do. She wants a guy that's actually invested in her as a person. So that, that inspired yeah, you to aspire to get all, yeah. all the things on the list. Well, it forced me to see myself <laughs> the way that she saw me, not the way I saw me. Yeah. I was okay with the way I saw me. I was okay with that. But when I, when I realized how she saw me, it was, the, it was a mirror. It was showing me a mirror. And I, I didn't like that. I was, and the point was, if I couldn't have this woman, 
what kind of woman could I have if I could only get three out of 10 things on this lady's list? And they That's weren't too much to very add. Very powerful what you just said. That's very powerful. Well, there, I, you know, I wasn't satisfied with believing I'm not a quality of a person that can attract a quality person into a relationship. Mm-hmm. I wasn't okay with that. And that was a mirror to me. So, you know, now that you guys are both truck drivers, you, you spend a lot of time apart. How do you guys maintain your relationship with all that time apart? Yeah, you want to go there with this one? We talk all day long to each other. On the phone, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. So that's... it's kind of like we're, we're there in mind and spirit but we're just not there in body. But many times, you know, we call each other and just, Hey, how's it going? And then we spend like three minutes listening to each other drive. Like we don't have anything to say. Breathe, <laughs> And we're like, well, I guess but we ought to hang up. <laughs> realistically, by the time we see each other on the weekend, we have spent hours, hours on the phone during the week. So yes. by the time we see each other on the weekend, it's not like, exasperated that we haven't seen each other. We're just kind of like ready to be together, have breakfast and lunch together and do things around the house. It isn't like we've missed each other, you know? And then the other cool thing is we have an app on the phone. It's called life 360. I don't know if you guys have heard of that one, but it's a, it's Mm -hmm. an app called life 360 and you can see each other's location anywhere in the United States. It's like, it shows you a map of the United States and there's a little bubble our little balloon for each one of us. And so that takes the worry. If you know what I mean, that takes the worry. Not, I don't mean like, where's my wife? Is she hanging out with somebody? What I mean is like, where is she? And you know, if she's driving, I pretty much know it's cool to call. If I see that she's parked somewhere, she's probably doing something, you know, official business or getting a trailer loaded or whatever. But just seeing that we kind of know where each other is at all times. And guys, I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that. I don't, I don't camouflage myself and hide under the radar. Like if I'm trying to sneak somewhere, cause I don't have nowhere to sneak. I don't have no reason to like hide from her, but it's a comfort. We have this comfort that we can at any time I can just zoom in and see where she's at. I know what highway she's on. Plus if we make a wrong turn, like I can, I can call her up and say, man, I just missed my exit. Can you help me? She'll zoom in and see where I'm at. And then she'll say, okay, like the second road up there, you're going to turn right. And then you're going to turn left. And that helps a lot when you're in a semi truck. Hmm. Yes. Major. So, yeah. you know, we and talk about quality time, you know, for couples that they need to be spending, you know, a lot of quality time, about six hours a week with each other. And you guys, you found a way to spend that quality time over the phone. Well, it goes back to the whole thing of you either want, you either want to be together or you're, yeah. you're just kind of obligated, you know, we enjoy being together. We love it, man. It's, you know, <laughs> I we know people. We know people personally that are just together because they're obligated. They don't have much of a relationship. Not really what a relationship is. And it ain't just because you know, in the Bible it says you're married for life. You know, that's that's not why. But if you're, it doesn't matter if you're married or not married. But if you don't actually like being together, then being on the phone or hanging out is more of a burden or bother you know yeah absolutely we you, guys are, we- you guys are living a movie that wayne dyer made called the shift it's on youtube and yeah, it talks seen, about yeah. the morning of life to the afternoon of life and spirituality is number one on the man's list to get there and it's really cool to see that living in action whether you were consciously trying to do that or if you learned about it and and did it we didn't know what we were doing along the way, but <laughs> eventually, yeah, eventually we had to, we had to identify it like, well, well, like how did that work? What did we do? Yeah. So last question, what is it that your partner does that, you know, they love you brings me flowers and or cards and, or teddy bear. And, and I mean, it's not a special occasion. It's just cause he comes home and, and shows up with flowers or, something to just to say he loves me and i think she uh she always responds she always responds when uh, i can hear 
I can hear her tone while she's talking to me on the phone. I can hear something off in her tone and I'm able to interpret. And when I'm in the same room with her, I can tell by just her movements and the way she moves around that something's on her mind or something's going on. And usually it's not something I'm not allowed to know about. It's usually something she don't, she's just not wanting to deal with or not wanting to talk about. And the instant that I bring it up, she starts crying and hugs me because <laughs> it's a release. It's like, God, I've been carrying this thing. My mom said this thing two days ago and she thinks, you know, she thinks something that I didn't mean to do it. I didn't mean to do it. She's just accusing me. And I can just tell I can, we have that sense about each other and hers is pretty much, she can sense that same way about me but it's usually she can sense when to just like leave me alone and leave me in my space and not badger me or not say anything. But then I sense her doing that. So then we connect again, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, am I exaggerating? No. Nope. <laughs> we sense, we, we can just sense each other's moods and feelings because I don't think it's because we've been together so long that we've known each other. I think that we've been this way for pretty much since the beginning. Right. I think so. I was able to see through you're so authentic and just beautiful. I was just like, I haven't had that ability with other people, but when I noticed her, I knew that it was a connection with her. It wasn't a skill. I didn't have the skill. She did it to me, guys. <laughs> <laughs> she did it to me, man. She brought these things out of me that I strived for all of my, all through the years if people listen to, I'm not self-promoting, but if, when people discover my other podcast recordings, I have a rather harsh, disturbing life story, don't I? Yes, you do. It's not typical. This, my life story is beyond the norm, but from homelessness, drugs, taking advantage of women, I had that skill because I knew how to play their emotions. And now I don't take advantage of her. I take advantage of the moment to catch her when she needs it. And uh, I've, I heard, I think it was Brene Brown. I'm going to use Brene Brown as a reference. This defines us, I think, an explanation. Brene Brown said a, a, a relationship, especially in a marriage, whether it's a same-sex marriage or, or whatever it is, if it's a marriage, it's not 50-50. It's not 50-50. It's both of us being 110%. But what that means is when she's feeling down, when she's depleted, when she's emotionally burned out, she's down to her 20%. I got to step up and be the other 80% for us. Not for her, not for me, but for us. That works. It works, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then when, I, when I'm down or when I'm blown up, when I'm out of control because I'm, I'm in one of my, she calls it my, I'm doing my Wayne thing. <laughs> when I'm doing my Wayne thing, she steps in and she smooths it back down. Her power, her influence on me is she draws me back down to where I'm supposed to be. Not in a bad way, but in a complimentary way, but it's not a 50, 50. When she's feeling 80%, I can notice she's on her, she's dancing around in the kitchen. She's in a great mood. I can part, I can peel away and I can go do the things I need to focus on without her, without needing to be with her or she doesn't need anything. But if she's not, I'm, I'm, I'm obligated to like set aside whatever it is I, I'm trying to do, whatever I got going on, which I got some all the time. Amen. And I go in the room with her and I just start doing dishes with her. Or if she's cooking, I start cooking with her. Or if she's cleaning the house, I volunteer to clean the toilet. And then she comes back to me and goes, I'm glad you're here. I just really needed this, you know? Yes. Well, Wayne and Bernie, it sounds like your relationship is quite an inspiration and can be an inspiration for a lot of couples out there. I think one thing comes to mind and that is that love finds a way. And we want to thank you so much mm -hmm. for being on our podcast today. Thank you. We're glad to be here. We get wounded through relationship and we heal through relationship. And we hope that you guys, by sharing your story, has enriched your lives and the lives of our listeners. Yes. We want to 
thank all of you for joining us today on Couple Synergy. Our passion is in helping couples and people have happy and healthy relationships. And this podcast gives us a fun way of bringing our knowledge and expertise to you, our listeners. For all of you listening, please let us know how you enjoyed the show. If you have any questions, comments, or topic suggestions, please email us at contact at couplesynergy.com. For more information about Couple Synergy and our programs such as Relationship 101, our home study course, the Couples Weekend Intensive, and our premier coaching program called Couple to Couple, look us up online at couplesynergy.com. And if you know someone who could benefit from this episode, please download it and share it. And thank you for listening. And until next time, synergize your life and synergize your love. You have been listening to Couple Synergy with Dr. Ray and Jean Ketkodian. Couple Synergy was recorded, edited, and produced by Dr. Ray and Jean Ketkodian. Voiceover and music entitled Breathe and Let Go was recorded and composed by Gina Gonzalez.